Well, welcome to Tea Time Spiritual Conversations for, with, and about women. I'm your host, Twana Henderson. And as always, I want to remind you to like this broadcast and to definitely share it with someone in your life. Well, I'm excited about today's guest. Our guest is Paige Allen. Paige is an executive pastor at Church on the Rock in Lubbock, Texas. Paige pastors the staff and gives oversight to Global Missions, um, the new Legacy Home for Women, and Bloom Women's Ministry. Paige also co-hosts the Bloom podcast, Bloom Talks, and is the author of her new book, He Knows Your Name. Paige travels internationally to speak and teach, and she and her husband, Josh, have two incredible daughters. Paige, welcome to Tea Time. Well, thanks for having me, Twan. I'm excited to be here. I'm so glad that you are here. You know, I thought that I had a full plate, but wow, you're, do- <laughs> you're doing some amazing things. <laughs> well, when you list it all out, it sounds like a lot, you know, but I think, I think honestly, most women, if we stopped and we asked them everything they did, they- we would all have a long list. I don't know if I know many women who don't <laughs> have a lot on their plate. We all need a long vacation. And, you know, I really <laughs> love talking with women leaders because there's always so much insight that uh, comes with just walking in those shoes. Um, but I really want to go back to the foundation because okay. I know um, and I understand that you are, grew up as a pastor's kid, a PK, as we call it. Yes, them. I did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you plan to kind of stay as far away as you could from vocational ministry and here you are as a pastor. Yes, this was this was not the plan. <laughs> I did. I did grow up as a as a PK and uh, that meant I saw a lot of great stuff, but I also saw some behind the scenes things that were just hard. I saw difficult things that my parents had to walk through. I saw um just how people can be mean, especially when they're hurt, you know. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm so blessed. I really did have a true relationship with the Lord, um, really, especially starting in my teens, just for myself. I loved God desperately, mm-hmm. but I made it very clear to him. I really, I really did not want to have much to do with the local church. And I definitely did not want to work for the church. And um, and yet, you know, the way God works, I always say, be careful about saying never. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, there was such a special, sweet time. I actually had, I left my hometown uh, for college. And during those four years, the Lord really began to deal with just offenses that I had taken up and mm-hmm. real wounds that needed to yeah. be healed. Yeah. And um, about five years after I left home, I, I came back to visit my parents one weekend and I was in a church service. I was sitting on the front row next to them, like they always, like I always did. And I just started, I actually just started weeping. And I don't know if you've ever had one of those moments, Twana, where I didn't even know why. I was like, yeah. I, it was during worship. And and I just was like, Lord, why am I, what, what's happening here? And I really felt like he just said, look around. And I began to look around all these people. And he, and he just kind of said, and how do you feel? And I realized I just felt so much love. And and he just kind of said, you know what? Like, I you're healed. You're healed from the hurt. You're healed from the fence. Oh, wow. You've walked through forgiveness. And then he said, these are your people too. Wow. And so I, I really felt like he was saying, okay, you're supposed to be connected again. And so I said this. I, I had just gotten married. I was, I was a newly married. And I said, well, if this is you, God, you have to tell my husband. Because he had always said too when we when we got married, he said this. I love that your parents are in ministry. Just promise me you're not going to drag me back there, and we're going to do it too. So, I, I that was kind of my fleece before the Lord, I think. And in the way God does, about four months later, my husband came to me and he said, "You're not going to believe, but when I'm in prayer with the Lord, I keep feeling like He says we're supposed to go back to your hometown for a little while." expecting me to say, oh, no, that's not happening. And I just burst out in tears and said, yeah, he told me. He told me four months ago. So wow. uh, we we ended up back in, in the town where I grew up. And, yeah, and now I am on staff at that same church that my parents founded wow. almost 40 years ago. Oh, yeah. my goodness. That is so amazing. And, I, you know, I love how 
how the Lord just kind of brings us around like that. And, and then also just how the church really parallels of just family, you know, family, you love them, but you like, they make you sick at the same time. And, you know, and that's kind of how the church is, but you need them, you know, and there's so much there. Um, now your role now, what does your role really entail um, at the church in, in Love Us? So now my role is I get to kind of just oversee several areas. Our church has grown a lot in the last probably 10 years or so. And so um, I get to oversee a lot of things that are outward focused. And so we have a, a global missions department um, where we support full-time missionaries. We actually train and send full-time missionaries, and then we do a lot of short-term trips. So I have a team actually that works there, but I kind of get to be the visionary for that. Mm -hmm. And then we, uh, just five years ago, we started a home for women that needed a second chance. And um, we had an, we have an outreach center where we, we do GED testing, we do food, uh, we do clothing, we just do a lot of basic needs help. And we kept seeing women come through our doors. Some were coming out of incarceration, some were coming out of um, addiction, some were coming out of unhealthy relationships, really wanting to change. Yeah. But what we found was that f mo mostly a financial component. If they could not figure out how to do that on their own, they would go right back to really unhealthy, toxic, abusive, you know, addiction type relationships. And so we kind of had this idea of, okay, if we could create a space, a time, and so we've created this thing, it's a 15-month program mm -hmm. where women have a safe place to live. They mm -hmm. kind of go through this program um, where the first three months they don't work, but then we really help them find good jobs where they're surrounded by good people. We have a financial coach that helps them get out of debt, that helps them, you know, just kind of get things into place. Um, we, if our, a lot of our women, their kids are, uh, you know, in the system with CPS or family members have them. And so we really work with them over those 15 months to see if they're at a place where they can, you know, get back custody. And anyways, I'm going, I'm going into this a long time, but I'm passionate about it. And so I get to help uh, run that. We have a full-time staff that runs the day-to-day -day operations, but, um, I get to, honestly, I raise a lot of money for it and cast vision. And I'm actually there one day a week is all. Uh, and it's probably my favorite day of the week um, because there's something about women who, well, they don't have anything to hide at that point, mm -hmm. and they're just really honest. Yeah, and it's really yeah. refreshing. So I get to oversee that too. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I mean, we need to talk to you offline about that because I'm like, okay, getting ready to start something similar to that. And so as you were talking, I was like, oh, you know, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. I've, let's talk offline because I've learned some things. <laughs> uh, okay, good. We will yeah. definitely have to do that. So now let me ask you: Is your dad still the pastor? Uh, no, it's a great question. My dad, actually, we kind of had a transition three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad is still here, though. He's he's the founding pastor, but uh, actually, my brother-in-law is now the lead pastor. Oh, wow. So you said something about family a while ago, and I was like, yes, <laughs> I understand family dynamics. And, you know, that's, I'm so, I'm so pleasantly um, amazed at how the Lord has walked us through it. Mm -hmm. Um we walked it out very slowly. Mm -hmm. um, probably that whole transition process took about, you know, two to three years. So really it's been yeah. about a six year process. So he's still here. He's still involved, but Good. he gets to do what he wants to do oh, and he doesn't have to do everything. Well, he's, else, earned, so. he's earned it by now. That's right. That's right. Uh, so I want to go back to your role because, you know, and then I think I know the answer to this question, mm -hmm. but um, have you received much pushback? Um, as a female in, in vocational ministry? And how have you dealt with it, if you have? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes and no. I have, for sure. Uh, especially kind of early on. I've I've worked full-time at a church now for, for 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I first started, people kind of like, kind of feeling it out. Um, what was really healthy was it forced our church to really look at what we believe scripturally, what we believe theologically, mm -hmm. and come to a place of belief mm -hmm. so that then it, it, it got easier to say, well, this is this is what we believe, this is what we see in scripture, and I invite you to, you know, look for yourself and seek the Lord. I, I have had some pushback, and I finally come to the place of, you know what, I am confident in what the Lord has asked me to do, mm -hmm. and it's not my job to change people's opinions. 
Yeah. What my job is, is to serve the Lord with my whole heart and work as diligently as I can. And what's been really fun is, is people who maybe initially were a little bit skeptical Mm -hmm. yet have stayed in the church, you know, a year or two later have come around and said, you know what? I wasn't too sure (laughs) about, about you when you were preaching that Sunday or, or whatever, but it caused them to seek out scripture for themselves and to Mm -hmm. ask some hard questions and to, to just come kind of full circle. So, so I've had some pushback, but I've, I've also, I think because I haven't made it my cause yeah. to change everyone's mind. Yeah. Um, I've just let people take that journey themselves. It hasn't been, it hasn't been too bad. Yeah. 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 That's a good, that's a good answer. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now I know that you have traveled, um, you know, with speaking at conferences and uh, different events internationally and nationally. Um, and I'm sure that you've probably encountered women from just various backgrounds, various walks of life. What has been one of the most impactful experiences that you've had mm. with that? Oh, I've I've had a lot of um, impactful experiences. There's something about, especially when you step into a different culture, and yet that culture, especially within the church world, they still are just praising Jesus. You mm-hmm. you, learn, you see God from a different perspective. But the, the this thought that is coming to my mind, I actually share this story in my book. I went to the I've gone to the nation of India five times, mm-hmm. and uh, one of my very last trips, I had the privilege of speaking within 24 hours to three different groups of women, and all three groups were completely different. Uh, you know, socioeconomic, mm-hmm. uh, demographic. India is so vast. So, like the first group, it was a it was a small group. It was young moms. Um, they actually predominantly spoke English. I kind of felt like I was sitting down with a bunch of my friends, mm. and uh, we had we had tea and uh, biscuits, and and I ended up speaking on worry, and it was just so good. They opened up, and then and then right after that, that same day. Um, I went across the city, it took about an hour, into one of the slum areas Mm -hmm. of India. And this group of women, I mean, you know, they were just, you know, in in India too, there's castes of different, you know, levels of people. And so this was kind of like the lower caste. You know, you could just just see the poverty everywhere. Mm -hmm. And yet these women came to this women's meeting and I was in this like concrete room. I remember like my back against the wall because there was there was no room. The ladies just crammed in every space. Mm. They were so hungry for the Lord. And I found myself speaking on the exact same thing again about worry. Mm. And then the very next morning I got a call and they said, hey, could you come do one more um, event? And they said, but your team can't come with you, just you, because this, this is kind of a an elite group of women, which I didn't know what I was that meant at first, but I said, yes. And I found myself in this room with Twana, I'm not getting you the most gorgeous women I've ever seen in my life. And I found out they were all Bollywood actresses and, um, they kind of worked in the art, India's version of Hollywood. Yeah. And I spoke on the same thing on worry. And I walked away from that realizing two things. The first thing was just this realization of women. It didn't matter if they were the women who had everything. Mm -hmm. They were still facing worry. They were still asking the same questions as these moms who were just trying to get food on the table for their kids, you know? Yeah. And, um, but, but personally, one of the things that really messed with me was when I came home, when I, I had jet lag. And I couldn't sleep. And so I got up and I did something I probably shouldn't have done. I got on Instagram and I decided I would try to figure out who those famous girls were. Because oh, wow. I didn't know who they were. You know, I don't I don't really watch Bollywood films or whatever. And so I started scrolling through and I, I knew enough people to make uh, connections. And like the first girl I saw, I found um, she had 3 million followers on Instagram. She was a famous actress. The wow. next one I found, she was Miss India. I didn't even know that, but she actually was... Miss India. And what happened was the next day when someone asked me about my trip to India, instead of telling them about how God was so real in all three of those moments, 
my narrative changed and I started telling people about how I had gotten to minister to the famous women. Mm. And probably about, I don't know, maybe three weeks later, I was actually preparing to uh, preach a sermon and I was going to share that story when the Holy Spirit just convicted me and said, why are you only highlighting a part of that story when you felt my presence in all three places? Wow. And I just realized, I think I do that if I'm not conscious of it. There's this tendency where we elevate so many different things when it was so clear to me, like, God desperately loved those women in all three scenarios. And so yeah. um, I think that's a story that sticks with me, um, both just the universal questions that women are asking, yeah, um, but also just this kind of caution to me as a woman in ministry of, you know what, Paige, you need to be so careful that you never highlight or choose or put uh, one group above another. Yeah. Because that's not how God works, you know? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I like that, how it does our needs and our desires. They just, they do transcend. And we mm -hmm. all, at the end of the day, just need and want more of Jesus, you know? Yes, um, yes. Now, I know that you have a book that uh, you recently wrote for women entitled, and I love this title, He Knows Your Name. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and it's based on conversations you've had with women in your church and at speaking events. Tell us how the book came about and, and how you came up with the title, because I love that title. <laughs> okay. Well, it came about, I was teaching a Bible study here at the church, a women's Bible study. And this lady came up to me afterwards and was telling me that she had been studying. She was talking specifically about a woman in the Old Testament and she used the phrase, she said, there's something about the nameless women in the Bible that intrigues me. Mm. And she left that day and that phrase, nameless women, it's like it just got implanted in my heart. Yeah. And I realized that a lot of stories in, in scripture that I'm drawn to, they are the stories of women that we don't know their name. You know, the woman with the issue of blood, you know, the Samaritan woman at the well, you know, mm -hmm. um, the widow with two mites. And so I just decided to kind of go on this deep dive and start studying nameless women in scriptures. Mm -hmm. And as I was studying them, I just kept thinking about women in my own church and that I talked to around the world that... I think underneath a lot of their questions or struggles, it it, came, it boiled down to this thought of, does anyone actually see me? Like, mm -hmm. is what I'm doing bringing any value to yeah. anyone? Because I think we all have a desire for significance. We have a desire okay. mm -hmm. to make an impact. But honestly, a lot of times, especially in certain seasons of women's lives, no, you know, we're taking care of toddlers or we're making Excel spreadsheets at work or, you know, we're doing things yeah. behind the scenes that yeah. doesn't get any praise. Yeah. And, um, and as I was studying them and I specifically started studying the nameless women in the gospels and just how Jesus went out of his way to make them feel seen yeah. and known. Yeah. And so that was kind of the thought of the book. And then, and then the, he knows your name. I think I just ended up writing that at one point. And actually my editor was like, I think that's the title of your book. And uh, yeah. I had actually suggested another title and she was like, no, how about this one? And as soon as she said it, I was like, oh, yeah. yep. Yeah. I think we do, you know, we do have a need for significance. You know, the book search okay. for significance. We, you know, we want to be significant. We want to feel a sense of significance uh, and identity. I like how you talked about um, when you were getting ready to get married and mm -hmm. you, you came to the realization that you had to give up your name. And it was like, like, like I didn't think about the fact that I've got to give up my name. I'm no longer going to be white. I'm going to be Alan. Yes. Talk about that. I mean, just what you were feeling. Um, yeah. Around I, you know, it's so amazing since I've put the book out, how many people have come up to me and said, oh, I get that. Like <laughs> I felt that too. And I think that's something that, especially as good Christian women, we rarely like voice that, Yeah. but it yeah. is, it's like our identity has been connected to a specific name. Yeah. yeah. And then in, in one day's time, and, and I wasn't even opposed to taking my husband's name, Yeah. but it was this feeling of like, oh, I like who, I like who I am as yeah. Paige White. That was my, that was my original name. 
oh, you know, who I I don't know, Paige Allen. Like who who is this going to be? And um, I think there's so many times that that women feel that way. Our names are important. Yeah. If you look in scripture, how many times does Jesus change people's names, you know? Yeah. And 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 there's something to know about, okay, no, like he knows. He knows my name. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, yeah. So whether, whatever it is, he knows. Exactly. He knows how to find us. He knows how to call us and we can hear him. I know you yeah. also talk about legacy um, mm -hmm. in the book um, and influence and the pressure of being known, you know, on that bigger stage kind of thing. Um, how have you felt that th that your platform as a woman um in leadership contributes to everyday women feeling um seen and and really known um, mm -hmm. around you you know i i am more passionate right now than ever about trying to tell women and encouraging them that i think sometimes we define legacy in the wrong way like legacy in and at its core it's it's the thing that remains mm -hmm. like like even when you walk out of a room if if something remains because of whatever you deposited in the conversation or even just your presence, mm -hmm. you're leaving a legacy. Yeah. And what I realized, even these unnamed women in the Bible, we still don't know their name. I have, I have no idea who the woman with issue of blood is, but we're still talking about her, you know, centuries later. Yeah. And so she's lost, a, she's left a legacy. And so I kind of want to encourage women and men alike. Is it enough that God knows your name? Like, and to know you can leave a legacy, yeah. even if it doesn't look like what culture says a legacy is, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. the legacy you leave with your children, the legacy you live with your neighbors, just the legacy you leave when you leave rooms, like that is valuable. And it actually may be more lasting than making a big splash on a stage or, you know, in some way that is quote unquote famous. Yeah, I love that, that legacy is what remains and what we remember. How does Paige want to be remembered? Mm. You know, I think I want to be remembered as someone who made space for other people, for their voices to be heard, actually. Mm. I really do. I, I want to be someone who, um, you know, calls people up, who called people up because I saw what was inside of them. Mm. You know, mm. I think that's how I think that's how I want to be remembered. Wow. Yeah. Now that's what about you, Twana? How do you, how do you want to be remembered? Oh my goodness. Um, I know I'm turning the tables a second, but I, I would love to know. <laughs> tables. Um, I would say, um, as someone who, um, made an impact or impression on someone that hopefully made them feel better. Mm. Um, and, and I think it kind of is, I think in some ways, it, I think it resonates with what you said, but just feeling like that you're enough just the way that you are. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of times we feel like we have to be something else, mm -hmm. um, but to hopefully be able to share and, and, and make someone feel like you're enough just the way that you are, which means that you don't have to be like anybody else. And I think in our culture, we always feel like we've got to look like somebody else. We've got to be like somebody else. Um, but that's not how we're made. And we're enough just the way we are. So yes. hopefully, hopefully, yeah, yeah. This has been so good. You have imparted, gosh, just some some really, really good um, impactful nuggets today. Um, as we prepare to close, I really would like for you to pray for our listeners um, and to, to really offer encouragement, specifically for women who want to live with purpose and who may doubt that God knows her or who, who may feel unseen, uh, whether in her home or her job or her church or whatever it is. But can yeah. we just pray and just encourage those who are listening? Yeah, I would love to. Father, I, I thank you so much for this time and this conversation. And Lord, I pray right now for those listening. Jesus, I thank you that you 
see them. And God, I really, I pray even right now, wherever they're listening, if it's in their car or at their house or at work, I pray they would have a moment where they literally feel that, that they know and they feel that you see them and you know their name. Father, I pray today for our listeners and God, I just asked, ask that you begin to give them new understanding about what it means to live with purpose Mm -hmm. and to leave a legacy. God, I pray that you would show them purpose in today. I pray that you would show them how the things they are doing, even behind the scenes, that those things are contributing to greatness and to the things that you have called them to do. Father, I pray if there's any changes they need to make in their lives to get into alignment with the purposes that you have for them, I pray that you would show them how to do that. Yes. And Father, I pray that on the days where they feel overlooked or overwhelmed, I just pray, God, that you would give them kind of just the, the, the nudge to take a step back and to take a deep breath and to remember, God, that you are with them and you see them. And therefore, Lord, they're not unknown, but they are known. Mm-hmm. So, Father, I thank you for that. I, uh, I pray, I pray in Jesus' name that every lady listening, that she would know, God, that her name matters mm-hmm. and that her life matters. Mm-hmm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Paige. I so enjoyed this. And um, I'm just excited about how the Lord is going to continue to use you and use your book. To all of our listeners, uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm Tawana Henderson. Be blessed of the Lord.